Uh, masterful remarks all done, I hope you all noticed, without a single note. I, I can't speak for two seconds without notes. Um, I am going to um, uh, ask now uh, Fred Litwin to uh, join me up at the front. Fred uh, is going to moderate the rest of today's proceedings. Uh, and Fred uh, is a dear friend of mine. Uh, he is currently the president of the Free Thinking Film Society, which showcases films on liberty, freedom, and democracy. And to date, the society has shown over 100 films in Ottawa, including several on China. Some of you may remember the incident in which they wanted to show a film on Iran, and the Iranian embassy protested, and uh, the archive, archives of Canada booted them out. Whereupon, I'm glad to say, the minister responsible said, I don't think so. Uh, and the film was restored to the uh, archives of Canada. Um, I think that shows uh, uh, the great courage and uh, uh, moral seriousness with which uh, Fred has taken on this job of uh, bringing film showcasing liberty to Ottawa. Little known fact about Fred, he has his own record label in addition to his many other talents. Fred worked in Hong Kong from 1997 to 1999 for Intel Corporation as the regional marketing manager for all of Asia. He oversaw a team of 20 people who launched the Pentium 3 microprocessor. And of course, for those of you who pay attention, you will realize that the dates that Fred was in Hong Kong coincided with the handover uh, from the UK to China in 1997. And in addition to moderating, Fred will spend a few minutes talking about the human face of the Canadian expat community in Hong Kong and the anxiety now rippling through that community. Uh, Fred, please come up and take a seat here. I'm, uh, I'm not going to hand the podium over to you right yet, but yes, by all means, please. <clears throat> uh, before it's uh, uh, Fred's turn, uh, uh, I'm going to ask Gloria Fung to come up, but before I do, I notice a couple of other people have come in. Uh, our uh, senior fellow uh, and former uh, Minister of State for Asia Pacific, David Kilgore, is with us. We're always delighted to have uh, David with us. Uh, Stephen Chase from the Globe and Mail. Uh, we're delighted uh, uh, to have such an important audience here for uh, uh, an event that I think is teaching us a great deal, not just about Hong Kong, but about China. Uh, let me now ask Gloria Fung to come up and introduce our distinguished uh, guests from Hong Kong. Gloria is a social activist and political commentator who has worked since 1997 to secure public support for the protection of human rights, the rule of law, freedom and democracy in Hong Kong, both as president of Canada Hong Kong Link and as coordinator of a global network for Hong Kong support work. She is the former National Vice President of the Chinese Canadian National Council, a commentator on Canadian media, and a speaker at numerous international conferences closely monitoring China's strategy of influencing international governments, communities, and media. After Gloria has introduced the panel members, I would ask them all to please come up and join Fred, and I will, I will not come back to the podium. Uh, after Gloria is done, it's all in Fred's hands, okay? Gloria, please. First of all, I would like to thank Dr. Crowley and also Mr. David Watson for making this meaningful Hong Kong panel happen today. This is exceptionally meaningful to the Hong Kong people when they are going through so many uh, serious uh, challenges in Hong Kong, and specifically the proposed amendment to the extradition laws that is being discussed and it's going to be probably passed in one month's time in Hong Kong. And this bill, if enacted, is going to jeopardize not only the security of Hong Kong citizens, but also citizens of all countries, including Canada, while they are working, traveling, living, or even in transit via Hong Kong. Today, apart from Mr. Martin Lee, we are also very honored to have three 
delegates with us today to share the insightful analysis of the situation in Hong Kong, and also what we Canadians, as well as Canadian government, can do to respond to the critical development in Hong Kong. First of all, we have Mr. Li Chuck Yen. Mr. Lee is a veteran labor leader, and he's also in the executive committee of Hong Kong Civil Club. He was a former legislative counsel since 1995, and uh, he also helped found the Hong Kong Federation of Trade Unions, uh, being the independent union center in Hong Kong. And it worked, he served as his general secretary. He also co-founded and is vice chair of the Labour Party. He's secretary of the Hong Kong Alliance in support of patriotic democratic movement in China, which organized the annual candlelight memorial event in Hong Kong, the only city in the entire China where the June 4 memorial event could be recognized and organized. Our next delegate, is Nathan Law. <laughs> Mr. Law is Namosisto's founding chairperson. He was also the former Secretary General of the Hong Kong Federation of Students. In, 19, in 2016, he became Asia's youngest democratically elected lawmaker in Asia. He was one of, he was elected uh, as a Hong Kong Legislative Council before Beijing intervened and removed him from office. He was one of Hong Kong's first three political detainees since 1997. He was sentenced in 2018 with Joshua Wong and Alex Cha for their leadership roles in the peaceful pro-democracy umbrella movement. I'm wearing yellow today. So this is an iconic yellow, a color for the umbrella movement. In 2014, Law graduated from university in Hong Kong, and he will be pursuing a master's degree in Asian studies at Yale University this autumn. Congratulations. <laughs> And last but not least, Ms. Mac Yin Teng. <laughs> Ms. Mac has been a journalist in both print and electronic media for over 30 years. She is the former chair of the Hong Kong Journalists Association and a co-author of the organization's important annual report for, of freedom of expression in Hong Kong since the 90s. Mac began his career at the Hong Kong Daily News in 1984 as a reporter, and he joined the Press Freedom Subcommittee at the Hong Kong Journalists Association in 1995. He has testified and spoken globally about the need to preserve press freedom in Hong Kong, and he was honored in 2007 as a champion of freedom of speech by the Visual Artists Guild. Let us welcome the three delegates from Hong Kong. Thank you. Before I uh, start with the moderation, I, I, I uh, as Brian indicated, I lived in Hong Kong in 1997, and I, I was there uh, for the handover. Uh, I just, just arrived in Hong Kong, and I was there for the handover, and that night uh, there were fireworks, but uh, at 2 a.m. in the morning, Martin, Mr. Martin Lee uh, led a demonstration at the Legislative Council uh, where he gave a talk from the balcony. And I was there at 2 o'clock in the morning for that speech. And uh, they gave out these, uh, the, these, um, mouth, these, 
I got one of these and face, you know, I, I'm really happy I kept it. Um, in fact, I went crazy yesterday trying to find it. Um, <laughs> but uh, so Martin Lee spoke, and then uh, around 3 a.m. or 3.30 in the morning, everybody dispersed. There were hundreds of people there, and I had to walk home. I lived in Happy Valley um, in Hong Kong, and I had to walk home. And as I was approaching uh, Blue Pool Road, um, I noticed uh, uh, somebody who was crying. He was in the streets just crying his eyes out uh, about the handover. and had to sort of sp spend around 10 minutes consoling this person. It was, he was really, really quite upset. You know, Hong Kong is, is, outside, is the largest Canadian city outside of Canada. 300,000 Canadians live there, and uh, they're all going to be in jeopardy. And, you know, it's, it's easy for us to say that's really, really horrible. The, but the real purpose, it's not because of the Canadians who are in Hong Kong. It's Hong Kongers themselves. That's what's really important here in caring about their freedom, uh, their democracy. Um, that's enough for us to be upset over what's happening in Hong Kong. Uh, and I, I was, when I was, I was in Hong Kong for two years and I started to see the uh, Hong Kong Supreme Court decisions being overturned by the National People's Congress. And so you could see even back then in 1997, 98, that things were changing. So uh, thank you very much. And thank you, uh, Brian, for, uh, for doing this incredible uh, morning. Thank you. I'd like to... Uh, I'd like to have um, the panelists uh, spend around five minutes and give us an overview of how you see things in Hong Kong, and we'll, we'll start with, uh, with uh, um, Mr., uh, Mr. Lee. Yeah, yeah thank you. Uh, this is the first time I come. I've been to uh, Ottawa, so very glad to see you all. And uh, uh, there's a rule that I agree between me and Martin, is that whatever Martin had, uh, had said, I have to avoid that. So uh, he, he is very strict on this rule, so I make sure that I, I don't say anything that uh, repeats what he has said. Uh, but firstly, I think uh, this year is especially 2019 is a very, very important year. There are two events in China that mark 19. Today is the 100th anniversary of the um, May 4th movement in China, 100 years. And the slogan at that time is, science and democracy. And it is really sad that 100 years afterward, China got the science, but not democracy. And even worse, the science that China acquire is not for the good of mankind, but to monitor. And with the technology they had, you imagine the big data they had on every Chinese citizen. And of course, of course, including Hong Kong and with science, without democracy. And the second event is the 30th anniversary of the June 4th uh, Tiananmen Square massacre. I was there in the square 30 years ago representing Hong Kong to support the movement at that time. At that time, my feeling is that uh, Hong Kong is very hopeful because if the students, the democracy movement, make it in China, then there's nothing to worry about the handover, right? The, the guy you met, he don't have to cry. <laughs> yeah, but what happened, of course, is that the democracy movement is brutally suppressed. And today, this year, the 20th anniversary, and we have been holding Candlewood Live Video for over 30, uh, for the past 30 years in order to commemorate what happened uh, back in June 4th, uh, 1989. And imagine, as I said, at that time we are hopeful, but after the massacre, it's really very desperate for Hong Kong because we are going to be handed over to a regime that murder its own people. And so you imagine the, the, the crisis that we face. But of course, for us as activists in the democracy movement, in the labor movement, in the political movement, we we have another thought. Maybe we can be contributive to the change of China. Hong Kong had always been um, embracing the values of democracy and freedom and the rule of law. And can we in Hong Kong 
contribute to the change in China so that China will become democratic. And that has been my fault over the past 30 years. And of course, in this crash of true values, authoritarian rule in China, uh, you know, the aspiration for democracy in Hong Kong, we have been in the forefront for the fight over the past 30 years. Uh, we have the June 4th, and then we have a, another generation of activists uh, in the 03, 2003, July 1st movement, where half a million, more than half a million people come up to march in order to resist the law on subversion uh, imposed by China. And now the third generation, Nathan generation, uh, was the generation, is, the, is the generation of the umbrella movement. So three generations of fight and 30 years of uh, the struggle against the Communist Party uh, uh, regime in eroding our values. And of course, this view is very difficult. Uh, with the Xi Jinping rules, there, there's a disqualification of legislators, six legislators, there's disqualification of candidates, there's the expulsion of the Financial Times uh, 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 editor, and so where's the freedom of press? And there was the uh, jailing of the uh, Occupy Central, uh, nine uh, was arrested and four now uh, is serving their jail terms just before we came here. So it's really saddening that in this crash of two worlds, or the crash of two values, it seems that authoritarian rule is always trying, is prevailing and eroding our base in Hong Kong. But, but then, the fight is always there. You know, um, with the, this extradition agreement that they are trying to introduce, and, and they would, the government, Hong Kong government said that they want to finish it in one month's time. So May, the end of May, is the deadline from the Hong Kong government. That's why it's so urgent that we come here to, to, to get all the support where we can on this extradition agreement. And so you can all refer to this document, you know, it's in PDF and also we have that some uh, layout uh, outside in the registration. And you can see the, the march of the people, 130,000 people come out to march and to continue the struggle and, uh, against the extradition agreement. So the fight is there, uh, the, the heart is there, and the struggle is there, and we had not given up in our fight against this authoritarian regime, and we will continue the fight. <laughs> and, and just uh, final words, and uh, is that the, the, the horror of this uh, extradition agreement is that one thing only I would want to say, is Hong Kong has always embraced rule of law. But this extradition agreement is tried to, uh, the authoritarian way of rule by fear. They want you to be afraid because they will tell you, you know, the big brother can always bring you, brought you back to China if you disobey them in the name of criminal charges. And even in Hong Kong, you are not safe. And so that's what, so why it's so important that uh, uh, we have to stop this law. So I will pass over to uh, Mac Yin Teng and, yeah, yeah please. Ms. Mac, please, thank you. Okay, thank when Mr. Lee talking about the, um, his memory of the June 4 event in, back in 1989, it uh, recall my memories also. I remember at the early morning of June 4, I crossing the corridor of Beijing Hotel where we stay, and after, you know, witnessing the brutal clearance of the Tiananmen Square. And we just speechless when, uh, when we met in the corridor. And this, is, this was not the worst. The worst is yet to come. Because after the, um, the clearance of Tiananmen Square, the Chinese government accusing the Hong Kong reporter and the, any foreign reporter to woo up the thing. They are fabricating, um, uh, defaming the Chinese government and you know, almost encourage or uh, push the Chinese citizens and students onto the streets, onto the uh, protest. And that's why the Chinese government adds some crosses to the basic law to, to allow the Special Administrative Region Hong Kong government can enact law to control 
the um, FIFO of information, which is the Article 23, and Mr. Lee had talked about it uh, when the Hong Kong government trying to enact law in year 2003. Fa uh, well, luckily, they failed, and, and at that time, I was the chairperson of the Hong Kong Journalists Association, and I coordinating the media industry to fight against that law because that will suffocate the press freedom and freedom of, of information in Hong Kong. Now, it's a new fight because the um, amendment, the proposing amendment to the extradition law actually will suffocate freedom of the press and freedom of information if it was enacted. Why is that so? You know, as I just said, during the, um, the, in the 1989 4 events, first they welcomed the, uh, the media reporting on the issues, but when the outcome is not to their likeness, they, they turn their back on us and accusing the media to blow up the things. So that will be the case. And it has always been the case that if things not in their mind or not in their likeness, Chinese government will easily fabricating accusation against anyone that they don't like. And usually, media will be um, targeted easily because we are always exposing the malpractices or the thing that they don't like. And that's why when Hong Kong media covering news in China, if it was so-called sensitive news in the eyes of the Chinese government, usually we were custody, we will, we will uh, put in custody and writing me more letter, and then we will be, usually we will be back to Hong Kong safely. And Hong Kong, as a matter of fact, is the safe harbor of Hong Kong frontline reporter who covering sensitive Chinese news. After the enactment of the proposing extradition law, Hong Kong will not be the safe harbor of Hong Kong reporter anymore. And in, I mean, naturally, as a reporter, I think both the reporter and the uh, assignment editor will decrease the number of covering news in China, especially those sensitive news. And this sensitive news probably is important for the people who are trying to do business in Hong Kong and in mainland China. Without this information, it definitely not in the interest of Hong Kong as well as those businessmen around the world. So that's why it is important to keep Hong Kong's status quo. I think it is easier for you to imagine. I don't know whether you recall that Ken Wong, anyone remember that name? Ken Wong is a Canadian analyst of the US funds. And he was jailed to two years imprisonment for, I mean, accusingly defaming a company that is the major enterprise of a province in China. Since the, we, the evaluation report damaged the industry, the, uh, the company, which will affect the livelihood of the people. And that analyst was accusing, defaming the company and put in jail. Now you get another one, another analyst held in China for similar reasons. So that's why it is important to keep this law out of Hong Kong. Otherwise, the fabrication of accusation of analyst, reporter, or anyone that's exercising freedom of expression will be targeted. And you can only pray yourself on the mercy of the Chinese officials that they, are, that they will not targeting on you. If they're targeting on you, don't think that you can easily escape from them, and don't think that if you are a, I'm a good citizen, I think that, and, and you do not set step on China or Hong Kong, you will be safe. 
No, it will not be the case. Because many ca cases telling me that if they are targeting on you, they will using so-called your witness to take you back. Your family, your family members, your friends will be used it. Remember Liu Xiaobo and Liu Xia. Liu Xia was, you know, trying to, the, the security bureau trying to use Liu Xia to um, get hold of uh, Liu Xiaobo. But Liu Xia loved Liu Xiaobo too much that she will not do as the security bureaus ask her to do. Then they use the brother of Liu Xia to put to um, to make Liu Xia finally agree to something. So don't think that you yourself can easily, you know, get rid of China if they target it on you. So we must keep this law out of Hong Kong. We must try not to allow the China law practicing in Hong Kong. And I would like to, you know, answer uh, something more if you are interested. Um, it reminds me about my uh, first experience of traveling to Ottawa, actually, because uh, I, I first came to Ottawa four years ago, just shortly after the end of the Umbrella Movement, and I gave an evidence uh, in the um, parliamentary hearing to introduce the movement and also the human rights situation in Hong Kong. And it, it's my second time to, um, to be honored to be invited to Ottawa. And these two trips, they, they share the same fundamental message, which um, we urge the international community and the can Canadian community and government to pay attention to Hong Kong's human rights situation and also to support and, and pay attention to the democratic movement in Hong Kong. But for this time, um, the message I'm delivering or the situation in Hong Kong is far much worse than the last time that I paid a visit four years ago. Four years ago, I came here as a student leader. Before now, I came here as a former legislator and political prisoner. Four years ago, I had not been elected as the youngest lawmaker in Hong Kong. And also, I had not, had not been unseated because of the Beijing's intervention in our own judicial system. And also, I had not been imprisoned and banning from running uh, for office because the Beijing government has been um, worrying about the growing influence of our younger generation and the threat we pose to them. So this had not happened, and um, my personal experience for the past four years has been a vivid example of how Hong Kong's liberty has been deteriorated. And I believe it, it's very important to let the global community to know that the situation now in Hong Kong has been worsening since uh, the movement. But that is not well, there's not a single example. We've got a lot of other political personnel in Hong Kong, prestigious professors, legal scholars, legislators. They were being kicked to jail because of peaceful demonstration. And there are several uh, youngsters who have been jailed for six to seven years because of uh, the conflicts uh, with uh, the police officers under some um, like major conflicts for the past few years. So it is very devastating for us to witness how uh, deteriorated the Hong Kong's liberties are. And for us, well, I hope that um, the worst will not come in the future because at least these people are tried in Hong Kong, but not in mainland China. So if uh, the amendment of the extradition ordinance is passed, then they may not face the trial in Hong Kong, which is seemed to be relatively fair, open, and with a relatively independent judicial system. When they have to face the courts in mainland China, it could be prosecuted and charged and convicted without legal representation or without an open hearing. So that's definitely a nightmare to these people who committed to um, democratic movement in Hong Kong, who has been uh, were well, sacrificing themselves for the benefits of all the Hong Kong people and the uh, uh, democratic values that we share in the liberty in, in the in the liberal world. So Hong Kong, as the forefront of the combat between the authoritarian values and the liberal values, indeed these people needed uh, your your attention and the support from the global community. 
recently just mentioned uh, it is the 100 years of anniversary of uh, the 4th May movement. And it reminds me a quote from the founding uh, Chinese, Communist, Chinese Communist Party member and also leader of the movement, uh, Mr. Chen Duxiu. He said that um, research lab and prisons are the valuable place for uh, are the place for valuable civilization because he came and uh, he, he just being locked in jail for several times during that period of time under the Qing government. And I think Hong Kong has been stepping into that era. We've seen a lot of intellectuals being locked in jail and they um, produce valuable um, documents and, and, and thoughts in jail. And um, I believe that is um, an, an era that Hong Kong is stepping in. And it's definitely devastating for us to see these people who, who are very famous and very um, intellectual in terms of their expertise, but they have to uh, locked in jail for months and for years. I hope that um, in the future, um, as we get into um, the, the battle of the amendment of uh, the, the, the extradition ordinance, they will not be uh, trialed in mainland China. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to ask the panel, um, was there any response from the Hong Kong executive to the enormous demonstration against the extradition? And have any of you spoken to people on the executive about the proposed law? Probably as a reporter, I remember very, very well what the uh, government official said after, the, after 130,000 people took into the streets. The secretary for security, who was responsible for introducing the uh, amendment bill to the, to the let's go, saying that um, we respect freedom of expression, um, but the number of people took into the street is not the most important thing. <laughs> then you know what the reaction is. And yeah. then they still pushing through the legislation. And as a matter of fact, after you know, some um, I mean, international outcry, the chief executive, Carrie Lam, have, have a stand up uh, on the 7th of May in Hong Kong, still trying to push through the legislation and only supplementing that they will listen. That doesn't mean that, uh, I mean, okay, the bill taking to the bills committee doesn't uh, stop the government from listening to the people. So everyone is hoping that, ah, is there any, I mean, leakage, any room for change? But then he will say, okay, we leave the thing to the uh, chief justice, uh, the uh, secretary for justice, uh, Jurisa Zhang, and the uh, James Lee, the sec uh, Secretary for Security, who spoke in the press conference just a few hours ago in Hong Kong. Again, Mr. Lee stressed that uh, it is important to have the bill passed in the logical and, I, I mean, indirectly um, responding to the accusation that the chief executive <coughs> who have the power to give law to the application, to the request from China, saying that the, the chief executive, since there is no uh, long-term agreement, it is more room for the chief executive not to approve the request from central government, which is totally absent, nonsense. We all know that, you know, from the tracking record of Carrie Lam, who usually taking every request or um, instruction from Beijing government. And now you're saying that without a, a long-term agreement, the chief executive actually have more room to say no to the Beijing government? That is the reaction from the Hong Kong government. Mm. Uh, also, um Actually, when uh, the secretary of um, uh, the chief secretary said that number is not important, 
I agree completely with him from his point of view. <laughs> from his point of view, because only one person is important to them, Xi Jinping. And uh, we, uh, with the demonstration, of course, we will continue to mobilize people on the street to continue the fight. And, 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 and the, the international trip that we're having is actually, we know one thing, which, of course, the Chinese Communist Party will deny that. The only one that can talk to Xi Jinping is international political leader. It's the government to government. You know, the people we have spoken, but they won't listen. And who Xi Jinping will listen to, he will only listen to power. And the power at, of, of, of the Canadian government, the American government, or any government in the world, uh, it, to, to speak to him, saying that, you know, it will be very damaging to Hong Kong and everyone is watching. So that's why it's so urgent that we come to this trip because we have only one month time, according to the chief executive. He wants to do it in one month time and get the bill passed. So he, she's going to bulldoze it over and therefore it's very urgent. And one thing, of course, they always said that uh, the, the standard uh, rhetoric of the Chinese government is that uh, uh, we don't want foreign government to interfere into the internal affair of China. That's their standard line. But this time, of course, we are, don't agree with this line. But this time, there's also one thing that is different from other issue, is because this, the citizen of all over the world, any government, the citizen of all, all national, will be affected. And so you are not speaking out just for the people of Hong Kong. You are also speaking out for for visitor, for Canadian, for American, for Europeans, or for British who are now residing or working or visiting Hong Kong. Everyone is affected. So you are, not inter you are protecting your own citizen, not just about Hong Kong. Of course, we need your, the support also for the Hong Kong people. But this time is, is, is also about uh, the citizen of the world. Um, it's great to see you in Ottawa. Um, <clears throat> for your meetings uh, this week with the government, um, what will you be telling the Prime Minister when you meet with uh, Justin Trudeau uh, this week? Are we meeting with, Are we meeting with Justin Trudeau? <laughs> um, no, who, who are you meeting? Are you meeting with the government and what will you be telling the government and what do you want the government of Canada to do? Well, simply, um, as Lee Cho Yan said, uh, it's going to be the Canadian government's problem. Uh, if there is another Canadian arrested on a trumped-up charge, and what is the Canadian government going to do? So there'll be more and more of this, I'm afraid. Um, so the message this time is not just Hong Kong, but your own people. Uh, the same message we um, mentioned today will be repeated to them, yeah. And of course, I would also add that there is no problem, there's no reason why the Canadian government does not interfere in China's internal affairs of Hong Kong. Because, as I said, when the joint declaration was first announced, the Canadian government was lobbied by both the British and the Chinese governments. So the Chinese government actually internationalized the Hong Kong issue. And when things are going wrong, there is, of course, at least a moral obligation on the part of the Canadian government to speak up. Very good. Um, actually, uh, there's one more point about, you know, you asked about the Canadian government. But one more point I want to add is uh, the Canadian uh, business organization is very important. Because imagine, who is the one that re First, uh, who is the one that affected? One of the sector that will be immediately affected is the businessman. Because, you know, Hong Kong is a place to do business, not just in Hong Kong, but also with China. So if, the, if the chi there's a business dispute, and they, want, they can use this law against the businessman in Hong Kong and uh, try to extort something out of it, saying that, okay, if you don't agree to pay, then you will be extradited back to China on the criminal charges. And one thing China is very good at, and very creative at, 
is framing up uh, charges against you. And so, we urge you also to help us in this aspect. Uh, because the business organization in Hong Kong is very afraid to speak out. Though everyone privately say that, they are really afraid. They don't want this law. But openly, they don't dare to. So it would be good if, with your, uh, the audience here to help us in influencing, the, say, the, uh, the Canadian Chamber of Commerce or any Canadian business organization in Hong Kong or in Canada to speak out because it's also the businessman issue and, and, and their safety. And, and so uh, this is something also in addition to what the government should do the, the, the business organization should also do something for their members. Thank you. Yes, the uh, American chamber in Hong Kong has spoken out, not the Canadian chambers, and uh, the U.S. Consul General has spoken out in public, but not yet the Canadian Consul General. That's unfortunate. Uh, Mr. Law, I'm, I'm, if you all uh, go on Netflix, I think you can see a great documentary about Joshua Wong and uh, the whole umbrella movement. Yeah. It's, it's quite a, an amazing documentary. Um, I, I think Joshua faces some jail time. And could you tell us what's next for the, 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 the youth the democratic movement in Hong Kong? Um, well, I, it, it's really, um, really hard to answer because um, the future is full of uncertainty. And um, we've we just uh, witnessed um, several of the occupation um, leaders uh, being locked in jail for several months and there are uh, legal scholars and, and professors and that, that we admired uh, much. So it, it's really difficult to say, um, well, how our pro projection of the democratic movement would be. But I think for now, uh, definitely we have to hold our grounds. We have to really defend what we have on hand and we give support to those in prison and to do what we can. And I think, well, um, several of us coming to Canada and also we'll be heading to US. It's exactly doing what we can because we really need international attention and uh, voice out on this matter. And I think um, it's not only about business, it's not only about um, government's response, but I think there's one sector that we really need to um, point out is the scholar sector because um, Hong Kong has always been like um, having a firewall between um, uh, the, the China and Hong Kong between the authoritarian world and the liberal world. A lot of scholars doing observation to China based in Hong Kong. And I believe it is very important for um, different societies in Hong Kong, especially those who are being penetrated and um, being influenced by uh, China's sharp power, influ influencing the local politics and their local uh, civic society. Um, the, these are the places that they have to do a lot of research on how they could defend their democratic system. How, could de how can they defend the um, infiltration from mainland China? And Hong Kong has always been the top priority of them to do their research and collecting information um, because it's the gateway of the international community to China. So if the scholars who have been doing research on these aspects they're based in Hong Kong, and if the extradition law is really being um, amended, so they are in grave danger, especially you could really see how they have political retaliation to the uh, Canadian citizens after the Huawei incident. So um, I think as the point of view of the liberal world, especially like Canada, is always being influenced by a lot of infiltration from, um, from, from the Chinese uh, government and Chinese undercover in, in the Cana Canadian society. Well, Hong Kong has been a valuable, valuable uh, spot for them to base and to defend. So it is, I think, for a lot of, um, well, uh, the, the, the government of these societies that are being influenced, it's a matter of national security and national interest. It's not only about values, but they are really, it, it is about how they could acquire information and to, for them to analyze their internal affairs. And I think it is very important um, to do a lot more on this aspect. Okay, I'd like to um, open up to the audience for questions. Um, first off, before we start, how many people here would like to give a speech and then ask a question? <laughs> okay, very good. So, um, uh, no speeches. Uh, 
please be concise and actually ask a question because we want to get in as many questions as possible. We have a hard stop at 12 noon. So, yes. Okay, back in like uh, like 2003, like Hong Kong people succeeded in uh, resisting the amendment of uh, Article 23, and so like what uh, are the you know the key factors that uh, make that successful, and so like uh, what do you think nowadays if those uh, factors are still uh, available for you, you know, to have another, you know success, you know, <laughs> in this battle, because I think both are very critical, you know, like uh, that uh, Hong Kong is facing, right? So then and now. So like uh, there's anything like uh, evolved the change, you know, like uh, what, uh, you know, you think you can, you think is really the key uh, factors for you this time? Um, I think back in the 2003, uh, the success uh, really is the people uh, movement, uh, because we have, uh, uh, the first time when we demonstrate is about uh, in December, we have about 60,000 people coming out to march, and then it snowboarded, and in July 1st, we have um, uh, ha over more than half a million people out, and then I remember at that time I announced one thing that uh, if on July 9th you want to push through the law, uh, we will, uh, another demonstration uh, to sort of uh, block off the whole legislative council. And, and, uh, and there's also a tension that <laughs> no one knows what will happen if lots of people come out to block off. Will there be, you know, sort of a more conflicting situation uh, or that the, the governor will want to see? And one thing I think very important is in Hong Kong, the legislative council, uh, of course, we are in the minority, the democr the, 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 or the pro-democracy camp. But then... Uh, the other Kasai, they are the ones that are representing the businessmen, the professional, what they call the functional constituency, and this is a system that we try to, you know, sort of overflow for many years and, you know, so far not successful. You know, the one other thing about the umbrella movement is that we want to have a real democracy to elect the chief executive and also elect a full legislative council and not assigning the seat to interest group. And one thing at that time in Zero Free, the interest group, they are also afraid. And, and, and because the, the political party that represent the interest group, they are thinking that, oh, if we side with the government, and then the people will remember them, and they will be finished uh, in, in any possibility of going to direct election. So maybe they can still be successful in the functional constituency. But some political party of the functional constituency also want to go for direct election. And the people have spoken. And so that is the thing that really changed because the people have spoken. And this time, we are, of course, we are trying the same formula. You know, people come out. And then this time, uh, even in a way compared with uh, the Article 23, the businessmen themselves are the one affected. So I, ho I hope, I only hope, I don't say dare to say that, you know, uh, it necessarily achievable, that they have every, every reason of their own self-interest to overturn this bill because they are the ones that are affected. And if we mobilize enough people on the street, then they can say to the Hong Kong government, oh, this time I think the public opinion is too much against this bill and uh, we will vote against that. There's, I'm still naive sometimes, you know, and, and I think that drives me going on. So hopefully, because of their own interest, because they are safety at stake, and because we have a strong movement, and, and also international pressure, uh, we can really uh, defeat this bill. And, and that's the analysis we have now. Um, the bill was supposed to be returned to the Legislative Council uh, on the 9th of July, and, um, 2003. And uh, a vote could then take place on the following day. But towards the end of June, there was um, a public statement released from the White House saying that the US president was opposed to the bill. And that was the first time that any government said anything of that kind. 
Uh, and it also called upon the Hong Kong government to implement democracy in Hong Kong as soon as possible. Because of the publication of that statement from the White House, the British government came up with similar support uh, for us. And then uh, followed by the Australian government, New Zealand government, uh, the Canadian government, and, and so on. And so the Hong Kong people took courage from the international support that was given to us. So I'm hoping this time around, there would be likewise international support. The um, Americans have spoken out, and uh, maybe you can work on your government soon. <laughs> yes, in the back. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for coming here. I kind of think of you as the Fantastic Four arrayed against a host of enemies because we know that China puts tens of billions every year into propaganda and outreach to the likes of us. So thank you. I have a question. You talked about extradition. This is obviously uh, central to what we are talking about today. In Canada, of course, we have our own extradition issue related to China. And what has been disconcerting for some of us is the speed and enthusiasm with which a number of important Canadian politicians and business people have actually gone so far uh, to say that it, it, it's the Americans' fault. And also, uh, some have even suggested, including a former deputy prime minister, that we should have just looked the other way and let uh, this fugitive, uh, uh, this identified person in the, in the extradition treaty, to go on her way. Shame. When you look at Shame. things like that, coming here to Canada, trying to promote opposition to this law in Hong Kong, um, do, you, do you not become somewhat distressed or perhaps a little bit uh, depressed about the potential here for a positive outcome? If these uh, politicians represent all of you, then I would go home now. <laughs> and obviously they don't. Right on. <laughs> so, so you guys speak up. Next over there, yes. This is going to sound like a very, it's going to sound like a very simple question with an impossible answer, unfortunately, I think. I have a lot of trouble understanding how Hong Kong government, or the Canadian government, or the Taiwanese government, or the Japanese government can possibly negotiate with an evil organization and expect to get a negotiated settlement. I don't see how it can happen. If you block this bill, They'll just get a more clever way to make sure that you pass a similar thing again and they'll just keep eroding it because you cannot negotiate, have, you can't have a free trade agreement with a country that is totally authoritative and brutal. Okay. So what's the solution? Okay. Maybe there isn't one. Yeah, of course it's an uh, impossible answer, you know, but we are fighting the impossible. So. Um, Firstly, I think the, also the answer to your question about politicians all over the world, in a way, and I mentioned about science, it's uh, had, had been now to China, and it's used for monitoring and uh, surveillance of the people, and democracy and not yet. And one more thing that had come to China, which is uh, also very worrying, is money. And money may be sometimes the evil uh, of the world. And politicians, they want to get uh, their seat. And sometimes, especially also in Hong Kong, I don't want to talk about Canadian politics, but in Hong Kong, there are lots of politicians in the pocket uh, of China because uh, you, if you, what we, in Chinese is not too good, it's very sexist in, to say that. In Chinese, we say, if you want money, they give you money. If you want woman, they give you woman. And that's it for the Chinese Communist Party. <laughs> and, and so it's really very uh, discouraging sometimes to see people really selling out their soul. Uh, for money, but that's the facts of life. But still, as uh, Martin has said, you know, we have also still allies, we have still people in Hong Kong uh, not, you know, tempted by money, 
not tempted by anything that, that the Communist Party is offering and still continue to fight. And so uh, we always think that in Chinese we have a saying that um, uh, the evil can never win over uh, justice. So uh, we still believe in that and I hope we still have that uh, hope in the future. Over here. Um, good morning and thanks for coming. This question is to all four of you, especially to Mr. Nathan Law. Um, it's, it's really heartwarming to see an uh, example of three generations of fight for freedom and democracy. Now, my question is that it is to me very optimistic from my perspective, because I spent my first 30 years of life in mainland China, mostly in Beijing. So as Beijing tightens its grip in Hong Kong, especially through education, indoctrination, and politics of fear, how confident are you that this fight will continue through the next generation? Well, it, it, it's a good question because I, I don't think that um, all four of us are blindly optimistic about Hong Kong's future. We've seen a lot of terrible things happening in Hong Kong. We've seen a lot of people selling, down, selling out their professions in order to trade benefits for themselves, but in exchange of our system, our protection towards a lot of um, professional values. So these are the things that we have been witnessing for the past years, especially for the past four to five years. The, the speed of that has been um, never <coughs> rapidly as um, what happened for the past few years. So, um, for myself, I, I don't think I would say very loudly that I'm optimistic in the near future. It's definitely um, terribly wrong um, how, the, how, how Xi Jinping government has been doing, but that is the reality. So, um, I think that, um, yeah, that, that's our judgment or prediction for the near future. But I think as an activist, if you lose hope, then you lose everything. If, as an activist, uh, like people who advocate for democracy, liberal values, we have to believe that it is the um, answer of uh, the, the just society we're pursuing. And it's, sometimes it's not a rational calculation uh, <laughs> because if it is, then uh, Benny Tai won't go to jail because he's a very prestigious legal scholar who enjoyed a very stable job and a lot of opportunities and these people, they don't have to sacrifice themselves to go to jail for months because of um, benefits, because of self-interest. The nature of us is to believe in what we believe. We see it as a faith in, instead of a rational calculation for our interests. And that is what we can outright await the, the Communist Party because they could only buy people, but they buy people with money instead of buying their loyalty with believing in a set of system. So when the time comes, when uh, they, have, they don't have any leverage on their political, or, or, or on, on their uh, economic um, profit, on their leverage on their nationalism and so on, then I do believe there will be chances in the future. So for me, I, I won't lose hope. I do have an optimistic, um, well, I'm optimistic towards the long-term future, and that is what we have as an activist and um, advocacy for these liberal values. Okay. Well, I will not classify myself as an activist. I'm a journalist. So usually I would not describe something as optimistic. Well, I would say I would deny to describe my feeling as either optimistic or pessimistic. I'm pragmatic. <clears throat> I will look at the issue, the difficulty ahead, and then think of how to overcome those difficulties. That is my position. And I think other journalists in Hong Kong and even around the world, that is the attitude. And that is the attitude that we can fight over the difficulties. So the, I think the next generation of journalists will still how this belief. 
even though I, I think I have been, you know, travel around and saying that the press freedom in Hong Kong has been shaken <coughs> um, for quite a, quite a, from a lot of, uh, a, long, a long time, but still we are fighting. We will not say that it is difficult, you just give up, you kowtowing. Do you, do you believe that kowtowing can give you the safety or the security? No, you, you, you know that it will not be the case. So the most pragmatical way is to fight over, to defend what you think you and your country deserve. And I also fight for what the media deserve and the Hong Kong people deserve. I think that will be the attitude of Hong, Hong Kong people. <coughs> Just before this event started, uh, a gentleman came up to me and said, Mr. Lee, let me remind you that no empire in history has lasted forever. And when the empire comes to the end, the emperor must step down and face elections if he wants to continue to be the ruler. Now, I'm older than Mr. Xi Jinping, but then we have Nathan. <laughs> <laughs> But they, but they are really afraid of Nathan and the young people in Hong Kong. They are really afraid. Because what they did actually is they disqualified them from the election. Why should they have disqualified them from the election? Because they want to hold, destroy the whole generation of activists. There's no avenue for you to participate in politics. And uh, they use some pretext of uh, what they call uh, your call for self-determination is, uh, uh, is against the principle of one country and things like that. And, and that is the Communist Party. They are you know, trying to uh, uh, destroy the hope for the next generation to shape Hong Kong. So you are, you are not low on quali qualified. And this is the fight that we also have to uh, continue. So now we are on the defense in terms of extradition agreement. But then after this, when we have again be a revive, you can say, uh, the, the, the people movement for, uh, uh, for Hong Kong, then the next step we will have to fight for the rights of the, uh, anyone in Hong Kong to stand for election. And this is something that is really very important, which the Communist Party have denied, uh, the whole generation of young people. Next. <clears throat> Over there. This is a follow-up from the last response. Beliefs is a, are a sure way to tribalism. Religion is the one factor that turns it into tribals. At least in the Communist Party, they do not allow religion to interfere in their judgment. And I think that's a good thing. Do you think that China would have advanced to the level that it is today if every member in the, commun in the Communist Party listened to every individual to tell us their views? Look at us here in Canada. We cannot get one single thing happening because we listen to everybody that wants to say something. It may, you may think it is absolute nonsense, but would, do you think that China would have actually come this far? I, uh, look, I'm not supporting just, China. No. I'm, simply just, saying, I'm simply saying just, that China is not all bad. Democracy is not all good. Uh, Isn't just it a, possible? ask your question, please. Isn't it, I'm asking the question. Isn't it possible that we can use the synergy between the two uh, systems of governing to find the best solution. Okay. So you admire their basic uh, dictatorship. <laughs> 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 Who would like to answer that? Uh, Mr. Law. Well, um, well, thanks for the question. At least you have the room to express your view without any interference. Here, 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 here. And um, yes, definitely resolving problems are an uh, important question on how we could increase the utility and the efficiency of a political system. But the way the Communist Party is doing is they erase people who brought up the questions. So there is no problem to be resolved because there is no problem based on the premises of there's no one bringing out any problems. So that is the problem <laughs> of the Communist Party. That's you don't even have room to express your view. You don't even have room to debate. And you can only listen to one single solution. Sometimes it works. 
it works sometimes. It is. You, you look at the economic development of, of China, then a lot of people admire how they have accomplished. But sometimes, and most of the time, it doesn't. Look at the human rights situation in mainland China. Look at Xinjiang, Xi'an, Tibetans. Well, these are the very obvious problems that lie behind this political system. Democracy is not perfect. <laughs> Democracy is just the most um, well, a system that respects us the most among all these terrible political systems. And we still have to figure out how we could resolve conflicts within this system. And that is, I think, that is the way that the Canadian community has to go. And at least you have the freedom to brought up this question instead of just being silenced. So I think I, I really respect you and your, your, your opinion. And that is, I think, the beauty of a democratic community. Maybe I, sh I share, maybe I share some quotes from the Communist Party with you. <laughs> I remember before 1949, before this uh, setup of the, the formation of the, new, the PRC, the Communist Party have written a lot in their own propaganda newspaper and saying that democracy and press freedom is the twin brothers and they are needed in the world <coughs> because they need it to overflow the government down. But after they you know, came in, into power, what they did, they almost, you know, they suppressing press freedom and no democracy is announced in China. And especially, this was the idea when Falun Gong was suppressed in, I think, 1990-something, the mid-90s. And they, and they take the lesson from <laughs> Guomindang, who allowed the Communist Party mouthpiece to talk about the admire of press freedom and democracy, and which finally overflowed Guomindang. So they not allow any such voices from appearing during the Falun Gong issues. So I will say your wishful thinking is only a tool for the Communist Party regime to hold the party in power. Then you will learn or you will, I will not say suffer, but probably you will have the lessons after several years and, and, and you, you will be Torch, whether it is a genuine think, wishful thinking of the CCP or is only a tool to gain the power. Um, can I say just one word? Of course, a lot of people would like to have uh, an emperor who is benign. Um, but is that the way God wants it? Otherwise, God can rule the world directly, you know? <laughs> but why does he do that? He leaves, it, he leaves to the free will of the people, the free will of his creatures. There must be some logic in that. And uh, so I, I would rather um, have my free will and work with other people's free will and try to make a consensus if possible. But if not, then what? Drop democracy? <laughs> I agree democracy is not efficient at all. It is not an efficient form of government. Uh, if everybody would listen to me, I would consider it to be efficient. But what about the rest of you? <laughs> and Winston Churchill knows that democracy is not the best, but is there something better? So, uh, and that is why no empire can last forever. Because the emperor, of course the emperor will die to begin with, but even if it doesn't, uh, things will come to an end. Look, look at China today. China is rich. But what is the core value in China? Money. Nothing else. Can, would you really l like to live in a country where the only core value is money, when you don't have it? And, um, and look, look, look at how many officials 
party cadres have sent their children away to Canada and the wives to the States, the money too, is sent away, and we call them naked officials because just they themselves are left alone in, in China, still working for the government, still receiving bribes, but having sent all the money away, having sent the family away, where can you find another government like this with these officials of their own government and they don't believe in their own government? Can that last forever? Um, doc, Dr. Crowley, do you, would you have something to uh, ask or add? I, I, one of the other questioners mentioned uh, Taiwan, and uh, I wondered if uh, we could shift the focus slightly away from Taiwan, just or for, uh, from Hong Kong for a moment, to think about Taiwan. Uh, the way that the um, one country, two systems approach was justified in part, uh, at, at least as we understood it at the time, was this was going to be a model for China to offer for example, to Taiwan to say, we can accommodate uh, everything that you value about Taiwanese society that has evolved, evolved freely since uh, 49. Uh, what would you have to say now to the Taiwanese uh, uh, who are being solicited by the Chinese uh, to uh, rejoin the mainland? Uh, uh, is the old one country, two system philosophy dead now? Uh, uh, and uh, uh, if not, what is the future of the relationship between China and Taiwan, given the experience that you have had in Hong Kong? Yeah, I think in the past when um, we tried to present a picture that uh, one country, two system uh, uh, the fight for our democracy and, you know, uh, one of the incentive for the Chinese Communist Party to sort of, you know, give in to our demand for democracy is Taiwan. But, you know, look at what happened now. Uh, Xi Jinping uh, is trying to destroy one country to his system. And this is so obvious. I think the Taiwanese, everyone know that it won't work for Taiwan because it don't, doesn't work for Hong Kong. So the, there's no... The, the so-called incentive is no longer, is, is, they destroyed the whole incentive for Taiwanese to uh, follow the model of uh, one country to the system. But then, I think, the whole Taiwan uh, government and the society should learn from Hong Kong because what they are doing to Hong Kong is what they are doing to Taiwan now. They have done to Hong Kong, they try to uh, lure Hong Kong elite and the businessmen to support the Communist Party by giving them a lot of business deal inside uh, China. And, and then the businessmen, naturally for their own interests, sometimes will sell out, sell out Hong Kong as a whole. And now what they are doing also in Taiwan is when you look at Kaohsiung, when the Kaohsiung mayor was successfully uh, voted in, and he said that, oh, my slogan uh, of the, the mayor uh, can candidacy is that Kaohsiung uh, uh, will be uh, um, uh, prosperous. Uh, we all will be rich. Kaohsiung be rich. Why Kaohsiung can be rich? Because uh, we will welcome China capital into, into Taiwan. And that is very dangerous. And that is the, the sort of uh, uh, the, the, the beginning of the end, you know, <laughs> if they go on that road. And now Foxconn. Uh, president is going, uh, the, the, the CEO or what they call the chairman is going to run for uh, presidency. And she, he is the one also who will be speaking for China. So, but I'm, I'm confident in a way that, especially younger generation in Taiwan, they won't trust that. And when they look at Hong Kong, they know what actually not to follow. And therefore, our fight is also for the fight for Taiwanese, uh, uh, that uh, our asserts for high autonomy is something that we have been fighting for, and, and that is a lesson for the, 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 the whole Taiwan. Anybody else on the panel? Yeah, um, no. probably I supplement a bit. We, just before we came, we talked to some um, Taiwan students. Actually, they, they are also wearing 
they know, I mean, we all know that a, a free bird will not like to be caged. But the point is they're also worrying that the uh, economic development in Taiwan is not good. And it is, that is why even the youngest supporting um, Han, uh, the, the, the new mayor as because they give them a hope that Kaohsiung will be rich. And so they're always saying that. They're worrying because they face the economic recess and they're also afraid that they um, I mean the democracy development in Taiwan is shallow. It can be easily um, changed or derailed by the um, economic interests or economical um, uh, incitement for them to at least take a more sympathetic approach towards mainland government. So they're always saying that it is a waste of time. They have competed with time to allow the democratic take roots in Taiwan before the great or the, the rapid or gradual economic <coughs> de development of Chinese enterprise take place in, in Taiwan. So we can never tell what will be the relationship of the Straits. But the people themselves have some alerts. They don't want to, uh, to follow the model of Hong Kong, but they also know that there is some restraint. And they are now in the race of time, and I hope very much that um, the international support can you know, give them more time to have uh, better ways in, in, in this regard. I think this is a wake-up call for the leaders of the world. Um, you see China spreading her influence, one belt, one road. Uh, and it's not just Taiwan, it's many, many other countries. Every country would like to have a bigger slice of the China trade. I mean, you would be a fool if you don't want money. You, you boost the economy and so on. But at what cost? This is the time really to think. <coughs> you, know, you have to decide one way or the other, what to do about it. China has to be held to her contracts, to her treaties. Otherwise, what's the point of entering into further treaties with China? You're just kidding yourselves. Um, I remember in the year 2000, I was asked by President Clinton, that was his last term and coming to the end of it, to go to Washington, D.C. to help him win over his own party, Democratic Party, Nancy Pelosi, uh, in, so that he could uh, support China, <coughs> China's entry into WT, uh, WTO, and also giving to China permanent normal trading relations. Um, because I wrote an article that I would support that. And uh, he was encountering a lot of opposition from Nancy. So I went there, and uh, Nancy told me that the vote, which would be taking place in 10 days' time, would be very close. It's, uh, she wouldn't know which side would win. She opposed it because she was worried about human rights in China and others. And uh, she said, either side could win, the margin would be could be as small as one or two votes. And I told Nancy, I, the reason why I'm not on your side is because I want China to learn to respect agreements. And let us hope that China will have the advantage of getting WTO and PNTR. And, but you must hold China to agreements. And that's the message I gave to Bill Clinton when I met him on the following day. I said, you don't have to tell me your motives, but I will tell you my motives, why I'm supporting you. I want China to learn to respect commercial contracts first because there's money to be made. And hopefully soon, it will spread to human rights. So China must learn to play by the books. But I told Mr. Clinton, if we win, 
Don't just fold your arms and celebrate. You must make sure that China honours every condition. There must be compliance. And I said to him, history would have one of two things to say about you. President Clinton worked very hard in getting China into WTO and with BNTR, thereby prolonging the reign of the tyrants. Or President, worked very, President Clinton worked very hard, and so on. And soon thereafter, there was the rule of law. And I said, compliance is the word. But unfortunately, there was no compliance. That, that's, the, that's the problem. If, you, if the US government had insisted at that time, before China got really rich, to comply, there would be a different story. But to give China WTO and PNTR without insisting that China complies with all these terms, I think has ended the US government as what it is today. But whatever we think of President Trump, he is waking up at least to that aspect. So I think the world leaders have to wake up what do you want from China? Just the money? <coughs> Without conditions? That's something very serious for them. Uh, <coughs> David? Um, they are a p perhaps a factor in, in helping you to succeed because you see just how terrible uh, the failure of the rule of law can be uh, for people of faith. Thank you. I always believe that if one single person's freedom is infringed by his or her government and you do nothing, sooner or later it gets to you. That was what I said when I was awarded um, an honorary doctor's degree in uh, Holy, Holy Cross University, a Catholic university. I said, you may think that I'm talking nonsense. But if there is somebody somewhere in the world who has lost his or her freedom and you do nothing, soon that government would be encouraged to do more and more and more, and more and more people would be deprived of their freedoms. Ultimately, one day, your government, your US government may have to intervene, and you may be a soldier sent there. So it could affect your own, own life. And, and that is what I still believe. I'm a Roman Catholic, and I believe that religious freedom is the most important thing. The truth really matters. And, and yet, in a way, it's very distressing, because then there are alternative facts, we are told, and uh, truth is not that, it's not that necessary, and uh, and I, I think I'm too old for that. I, I just couldn't, I couldn't uh, uh, bring myself to, to agree with that. But if you talk about China's suppression of freedoms of religion, and my Pope has entered into agreement with China, and I don't even know the terms of that agreement. Nobody knows it, you know. And yet it's being enforced already. But as a Catholic, I could only say this, that whoever <coughs> Xi Jinping, no matter how powerful he is, and no matter how naive the Pope is, um, God is superior to them, and the Almighty may actually make them think happy to be able to reach this agreement, <coughs> and then it may work out something differently according to their expectations. If you believe in God, this could happen. But I agree, if I treasure my own religion, I must treasure other people's religion. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'm sorry, but we've really reached the end. We'll have time for one more question. We'll go back from where we started to Gloria. Yeah. 
Actually, um, ever since the uh, proposed amendment to extradition law has been tabled in Hong Kong, it has aroused very deep concern around the world, particularly in Canada, where we have over 300,000 Canadians working and living in Hong Kong. On April 6, there is a joint statement, international joint statement. Uh, we have five Canadian community organizations uh, and also five American community organizations signing a joint statement uh, opposing to this proposed amendment. On April 16, there's a big rally in Toronto and it was actually eight community organizations, including human rights groups, and also representatives from three professional sectors came together unanimously calling for our government to speak up. I think today, probably many of you have also noticed that both Globe and Mail and Toronto Star have come up with an editorial piece on this proposed amendment as well, urging our government to protest this amendment and also not let China undermine freedom and rule of law in Hong Kong. So both civil society and also media have spoken up. So in your opinion, what should our government do in order to effectively stop this bill? Well, I, I, I just wanted to um, supplement several words uh, about the last question about um, the Muslim community in, in, in China. And I think it is, not, it, it is more than religious freedom. Well, if you look at the issues in Xinjiang and Xijiang, it's, it is exactly what the Communist Party wanted to do without any checks and balances. It is exactly the perfect dictatorship that they wanted to implement in everywhere of the world or in, in their own, own homeland if there is no other forces that they could monitor what they are doing. So it is actually an example for us to review, for example, in Hong Kong. Um, what makes us to have that discrepancy to have that prevention from becoming the same exact situation happened in Xijiang. And, and, that's, and, and these things that protect us to becoming that worse is the things, are the things that we have to protect. So I think that is a good example to showcase the nature of the Communist Party. They're, they're not worshipping, they're not respecting human rights. They just want the so-called stability, stability that helps them to govern, that helps them to consolidate their power. And that is what they have on their hands and in their minds. So I think that is definitely an example of them of a government that is so powerful without any checks and balances. And I mean, for, for the Canadian government, it reminds me of the experience four years ago. Uh, I, I, had, I gave a uh, testimony uh, and evidence in, in, in the parliamentary hearing. And I believe these kinds of things can be repeated because it is a gateway for us to really express our experience and uh, what we hope the Canadian government to do with a proper and um, very official way to do so. And it also helps to arouse the, the attention of the people. And I think uh, the people in this room could really spread this message because, well, politician has to be responsible to their voters. And that is how we could mobilize them to do, to do more on the issues that you are interested. If uh, the representative or your constituency recognize that actually there are a lot of people in, in their constituency are care about Hong Kong, they're urging uh, their, represent, their, their representative or the government to really speak up, then they have to answer to you. And that's the beauty of uh, democracy. So I think as long as we could, well, on the one hand, we could influence the people, then they bring changes in the um, representation and on the other hand, uh, the government should really step up to, uh, as what Martin and as what um, uh, Li Chen Yan said, they really have to express their opinion, issue statement, and urge the uh, Canadian um, uh, Chamber of Commerce in Hong Kong to issue the statement that um, telling the government, uh, that the Hong Kong government that if you want to remain the status of international financial help, attracting foreign investment in Hong Kong, 
then you need to protect our own autonomy and do not listen to the Beijing government on every single thing so that we have confidence that you're not um, a puppet. You, you're actually working in the interest of Hong Kong people and Hong Kong as a whole. So I think it is very important for you to change, for you to um, ask <coughs> changes um, for your representation and also the government has to do something very proactively in order to safeguard the things in Hong Kong. Because what happens in Hong Kong is actually representing the confrontation of liberal values to the authoritarian values. So I think it is not only about a place, but it's about a set of values, a set of faith, how we could defeat the ones that deteriorated. I don't like leading questions. <laughs> <laughs> if I was going to decline answering that, if I were in court, I would object to it. But Hong Kong is the litmus test as to um, how China honors her agreements. Um, I recall that uh, Deng Xiaoping said when he made this joint declaration with Margaret Thatcher at the time, he was saying that we Chinese always honor our word. We Chinese, we Chinese honor our word. But does the Chinese Communist Party honor its words? Xi Jinping also said rightly words to that effect, that to the Chinese, what they say counts, right? But does it? But Hong Kong is an interesting example. I mean, there is this international agreement that which Chinese government bragged about at the time, reminding everybody that it was actually registered with the, with the United Nations. Uh, and then, lately, some of the officials said, the Joint Declaration has already outlived its usefulness in the way they are right, because they already got Hong Kong back. And the British government didn't protest either. Uh, without, but I say, without the Joint Declaration, there could not be a Hong Kong special administrative region. Because without the Joint Declaration, Hong Kong and Kowloon would still belong to the Brits. The new territories would have to go back, so there would only have to be, there could only be the new territories, special administrative region, without the agreement. So China needed that treaty to undo the harm created by the two of the three unequal treaties. And having got Hong Kong and Kowloon back by the Joint Declaration, how could China say we're no longer bound by the Joint Declaration? But the British government said nothing. The rest of the government who supported and still support the Joint Declaration said nothing either. So of course China would say, all right, if that is the way you guys would behave, I can, get, I can do more harm to Hong Kong and I would expect you guys to shut up because the China trade still is important to you. And are you going to let China get away with that? over Hong Kong. So the only right thing to do is to ask China to honor her obligations to Hong Kong. Before there is reason for you to enter into more treaties with China. That is the only way. But of course, a lot of politicians, particularly those in power, will think differently. Two years ago, I came over with Ensign Chen and I talked to the uh, Canadian government people and they said, look, we know that a lot of Chinese Communist Party cadres have actually got into different political parties in Canada. And they say, oh, does it matter? Uh, Chinese come in and uh, the next generation will treasure our values. So sooner or later, they are going to be just like us. But if they are sent here as agents, you think you can convert them? 
So there's a lot of naivety going on. Uh, but of course, money is always the excuse for you to be naive and not think about how serious these things are. And, uh, and of course, I want my country, China, to be great. My great China dream is not just being powerful and rich. My great China dream is that all the 1.4 billion people in China will enjoy their freedoms like everybody else in the world. And I'm confident that democracy will come to China because this is the world trend. In spite of some disbelievers in democracy, that is still the only way forward. China may be the last to have democracy, but China would still have to be there. There's no other solution, no other way. And um, of course, I would not live long enough to see that, but hopefully, Nathan will be. No, I, I, I think Martin is not right in saying that, that uh, Nathan uh, is uh, going to see it. I think that Martin also is going to see it. Yeah. Here, here. If Ma because if Martin sees it, I'm getting it, I'm going to see it. But uh, back to the question, I think it's very important that, of course, the, we come here to uh, ask that the whole uh, the Canadian government uh, and also all the free party concerned come up strongly uh, on opposing this extradition law. This is a short-term thing that we really need a victory on. Um, and also, you know, from a Canadian point of view, you know, uh, you have already a hostage situation. And the question is, do you want to create uh, more hostages, uh, but the next time it will be in Hong Kong? And I don't think anyone would want, to that, want that because of the security of uh, any Canadian uh, here. But uh, finally, I think uh, it's more important also to fight this because in the long run, I think the group of male uh, yesterday asked me a question, you know, uh, how, don't talk to, not just about the extradition, uh, law. How about the whole long-term strategy of the world leader on China? And that is the question. And I think, you know, extradition agreement is something to show the values of the, the world, you know, the, the, the value of freedom and democracy. But in long run, one every country has to ask themselves, what is important? Is it only money or actually more important uh, further down for our next generation is the victory of the values of uh, freedom, personal dignity, and just justice. If that is the case, then in the short term, maybe we have to sacrifice some economic interest. Maybe we have to do that because in the long run, what sort of world we want is a very important question for every human being in the world. And we hope that every one of us will join together to hope for a world that is just and free and democratic. Uh, the, before we I'm thank sorry, our can, panel... Can I say oh, just one more thing? I'm sorry. I always want the last word. <laughs> <laughs> there is an, actually an easier way because China never said, the Beijing never said that we must legislate on the extradition law by amendment. Our chief executive actually said, Hong Kong or her government wants to pluck this loophole. So the decision belongs to the Hong Kong government. That's much easier. You're not going to offend China, right? So why don't you just get the, your consul general in Hong Kong to ask our chief executive, Ms. Carrie Lam, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> All right? And she would have to explain. Okay. Just uh, before we thank our panelists, I'd like to, uh, if we could all thank uh, the McDonald Laurie Institute and Brian Lee Crowley for organizing this great event. Well, thank you, Fred. And um, I would like. Uh, I would like, first of all, to ask you on behalf of the Institute to thank not only our wonderful panelists and our keynote speaker, but also our wonderful uh, moderator, Fred Litwin, for offering such a great event. 
and I'm going to take my courage in both hands and disagree with something that Martin Lee said. <laughs> Martin Lee, I, I, I'm open to correction on this, but uh, Martin Lee said that uh, you know, the value that drives China today is money. I actually don't think that's right. I think that, and, and this gets right back to a question that was asked from the floor in which what one of the questioners said, of course, China's abolished religion. Bullshit, okay? The religion of China and what drives China is the worship of power, of which money is an instrument, yeah. of which money is an instrument. And uh, China will spend any amount of money to maintain their power. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the, the degree to which uh, Canada and others have been complacent in uh, some of the things that China has done uh, has been, of course, in the pursuit of money. But um, uh, China has used that money as an instrument of their power. And I think that uh, we can only understand China by understanding that they worship power first. Now, I, 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 I will... To, again, take my courage in both hands and dare to speak on behalf of the audience. Because I, I believe what I heard from virtually everyone in the room was a desire to give support and comfort to the people who have come to us from Hong Kong to plead for our support mm -hmm. in their pursuit of freedom. Mm -hmm. And I've already talked to you about the uh, way in which I tried to give them a signal of support through my tie. Uh, and uh, in conclusion, I would like to offer a different uh, source of uh, inspiration, which I hope uh, they will take away uh, and uh, remind uh, people in Hong Kong about. And this is from one of my favorite poems uh, by uh, the poet uh, Shelley, uh, who happens to have given his name to my wonderful wife, Shelley. Uh, and this is a poem that many of you may have read at one point, but may not, may not remember the details about now. It's called and Dias. Because every time I hear about China, I think about and Dias. <laughs> and those of you who don't remember the details of the poem, it's a very short poem. It's, it's a story about someone who comes back from an antique land and reports that there lies in the desert a huge statue, broken and spread along the sand. And uh, I will quote you the last few lines of the poem. On the pedestal of this formerly giant statue, these words appear. My name is Ozamandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. And he goes on to say, nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck Boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. Thank you for coming. Thank you.